My name is Andrew McGowan. I'm a musician and athlete who geeks out on fashion, art, and great food. I've spent time working with elite performers, repairing instruments for major symphony musicians, training for marathons, and designing wardrobes from everyone from freshman college students to big city lawyers. Trequartista is the Italian word for playmaker and is used to describe a particularly creative role on the soccer pitch, typically behind the central striker. And as the musical Trequartista, I aim to kickstart conversations about topics and areas that I think are underrated, underdiscussed, or particularly important to a sustainable high octane life. This is the Musical Trek Artista, the podcast. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a wonderful Thursday. So, the topic I wanted to discuss today is the importance of getting your brass instruments cleaned. And this isn't to say that you shouldn't clean your woodwind instruments. I have a whole different soapbox about that. But the methods are pretty different. And as somebody who is a brass wind repair specialist, I have a lot of soapboxes that I get on because there is a rampant amount of disinformation spread about cleaning your instruments. I have a really strong chemistry background. And so when I was in repair school, but then also during uh, my first couple of years doing the repair thing, like out in, like professionally, I made it one of my goals to understand the nitty-gritty side of the chemistry that drives chemical brass instrument cleaning in order to help more performers understand why getting your horns chem cleaned, especially if you are a really active player, is the best way to maintain the longevity of your instruments. So I'm going to go over a few things that I find really helpful, and then actually break down some of uh, what's going on chemically. And a lot of this is also covered in the Better Brass Wind Care and Elite Brass Wind Care Masterclasses that I throw up. So uh, if you get a chance to go to one of those, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, other stuff that I talk about in those, like uh, what great dent work looks like, what bad dent work looks like, why you need to pay attention to those things. Uh, how to get to know your technicians in order to make sure like who's a good one versus who isn't and then uh, but a lot of it is centered around like understanding the cleaning side of stuff so the first couple of things i want to cover are essentials of like basic information that I think needs to be clarified before we really get into this. So the first is, um, what do I mean by cleaning? When I say cleaning, I don't mean the bathtub method. A lot of well-intentioned folks use the bathtub method for cleaning and tell others that the bathtub method for cleaning is a really great way of doing things. And it really isn't. It's great for like high school and junior high students in order to help them understand the responsibility that is taking care of their instrument. But in the grand scheme of things, especially um, given the small amount of soap that's used when you clean your horn that way, it's really not doing anything in the grand scheme of stuff. Like, yeah, it's going to kill some bacteria and maybe cut a touch of the grease, but um, that is a glorified, like not even half measure of the first step of a serious chem clean. When I chem clean an instrument, and just so uh, listeners are aware, uh, I regularly get customers paying me upwards of $150 to clean their instrument, because they are so impressed with the high quality of cleaning that I do. But when I start uh, chem cleaning an instrument and I do a detergent soak, which is that soap in the bathtub kind of thing, the soap to water ratio that I use is probably 8,000 times greater. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it also kind of isn't. Um, than the um, 
like the soap to water ratio that most people use in the bathtub method. Most people use like a tablespoon of soap and are just like, oh, I'm going to let my horn soak in this and that'll clean it. I use a gallon of soap per four gallons of water in my solution. And a bathtub holds, your average bathtub is probably 30 to 50 gallons of water. So if I'm doing a complete immersion for a tuba, there's probably a dozen gallons of soap in that. And granted, that solution isn't being like washed down the drain every time I do a cleaning. That that solution is probably good for 300 cleanings. So I'm going to use it pretty repeatedly. But it's one of those things where, you know, like unless the concentration of your degreaser is that high, you're probably not seriously degreasing the horn. Is the bacteria going to get killed? Yeah, but I mean, as I'm going to outline in just a second, bacteria really isn't the, the main thing we're concerned with when we're talking about cleaning brass instruments. So especially for professionals and aspiring professionals or people who are really active amateur players that are listening, it's really, really important that you get your horns chemically cleaned because soap in the grand scheme of things, isn't going to really affect the kinds of chemical deposits that are lining the inside of your horn. Um, one of the things I want to talk about for a second is like, if we're going to put on our chemistry hats really fast, in all of the chemical and electrochemical forces in the universe, gravity is the weakest. And that's like a, a big tenet of fundamental um, quantum physics. I don't know many people who can outmuscle gravity. And so the idea that soap and a brush and elbow grease will, or even just like highly pressurized water, will outmuscle ionic molecular bonds, which are one of the strongest forces in the universe is just downright ignorant. It just is. And so that's why we need to use chemicals to remove these chemical bonds. So the other piece of preliminary knowledge is about red rot. And I wanted to demystify the red rot thing really fast because a lot of people say like, oh, it's got red rot, and they never really explain what that is, or they'll just say like, oh, red rot looks like this. And then, but but like we don't have a fundamental understanding of why that's bad or what it is or how we can prevent it. So the more accurate term for red rot is desincification. And if we break that down really quick, we have D, so it's taking away zinc, zinc the metal, and ification, the act of it happening. So in desincification, the zinc is being taken away from the brass alloy. Brass is made from zinc and copper. And so we call this red rot because when the zinc molecules um, fall out of bond with the copper because they're bonding to something else, which is the chemical deposits on the inside of our horn uh, from food residue and saliva residue, Little pink splotches, or if you have a silver-plated horn, little creepy bubbly things, because a gas will be given off also, will develop along the tubes of your horn. And those patches are so weak that you can puncture them with your finger. And sometimes they'll just pop all together. And that requires patchwork to get fixed or just a replacement of the entire part. Patches and replacement parts are really expensive. I play a Wilson Euphonium, and Wilson replacement lead pipes are like $250, and that's just to buy the part, and not, not let alone install it. And Installing on silver horns is usually more expensive because you have to pay special care to not messing up the finish, but I mean, even, even replacing parts on on lacquered or bra brass instruments can get really expensive too. And like, don't even get me started on gold lacquered and gold plated ones. I mean, that's a whole waste of money in and of itself. And I, that's a soapbox for another time, but desincification can be prevented by chemical cleaning because 
by neutralizing the metal from the inside, which is what chemical cleaning does, we can actually fortify the brass alloy because when the zinc doesn't have something else to bond to, it will bond more and stronger to that copper alloy. And so when I talk about chemical deposits that are happening on the inside of our instruments, what we need to remember is like, because we are organic beings, we have a level of acidity. You couldn't measure the pH of your body. It's really weird. Um, I tried to do it with pH strips and that wasn't super effective. And then I wound up getting like a wacky referral from my dentist for like a way to do stuff. And we took samples and it was wacky. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that. I did it because I was fascinated and I wanted to see how far I could go with it. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, you're going to leave chemical deposits on the inside of your instrument because if you have consumed things, residue of that is in your mouth. And we all eat to survive. So there's food residue inside our mouths. And then our saliva is not chemically neutral either. It's actually fairly acidic. And so all of that, as we play, lines the inside of our horns because all of those particulates will fly into it. And so over time, if we're not making sure that we're regularly neutralizing our instruments, those can build up. And typically, those uh, chemical deposits take the form of calcium and lime, which is that nasty green stuff that you see line your instruments. And uh, those are pretty negatively charged in the grand scheme of chemistry. And so the zinc will fall out of bond with the copper because it can easily bond to those more negatively charged deposits. And so that's what causes red rot because the calcium and the lime will pull the zinc away from the copper chemically. And so we neutralize our instruments with uh, cleaning acids, particularly uh, phosphoric acids, in order to do that. So when you go get your horn chemically cleaned in a shop, they do that super detergent soak I was talking about earlier in order to break down uh, all of that grease and oil and excess nasty that's in there that the soap can undo. And then they give it a quick rinse and then they introduce it to either a an acid bath or an ultrasonic cleaner. And ultrasonic cleaners have acids in them, but they basically just allow the, the um, horn to be agitated a little differently. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but they basically do the same job. Uh, in order to chemically neutralize your horn from the inside out. And that's really, really important because eliminating those calcium and lime deposits is physically impossible without the use of chemicals. Like I said earlier, most people can't out outstrength gravity. You can't outforce gravity, and it is the weakest physical force in the universe. So when we have one of the strongest forces in the universe holding chemical deposits to our instrument, we need to use chemicals to neutralize them. And so uh, the best way to do that is what we call agitated soaking. So if, I mean, you could just leave it in the acid, but it's not going to be quite as effective as if you moved the acid around. You increase the entropy of the solution in order for... Uh, the chemical process to work more effectively, more efficiently, and more rapidly. And so with uh, a phos like if I had a tub of phosphoric acid, a vat of phosphoric acid that I was going to do agitated cleanings in, the way I would do that is I would put the horn in it and I would stir it in the solution as it's there. The benefit of ultrasonic cleaners is it will do that agitation for you because what the ultrasonic cleaner does is it shoots air waves into the fluid, making the fl molecules of the fluid vibrate around the instrument. So you can put something in a sonic cleaner and then walk away and do something else. But in the grand scheme of things, they do the exact same job. So anybody who says like, oh, the ultrasonic cleaner is better, technically it's, it's a little more efficient and a little more detail-oriented and allows you to do two things at once. But you can get virtually an identical clean out of just a phosphoric acid tank. I've done it thousands of times. And that sounds like I'm exaggerating. I have cleaned well over 3,000 instruments. I, it, it actually 
is is almost the same. I have done it thousands of times. And so when preventing desinkification, chemical cleaning is the primary method of that. And that's the reason why we need to get our horns cleaned pretty regularly because desinkification can really, really, really add a lot of operating costs to living and working as a musician. And not to say cleaning is cheap, but in the grand scheme of things, would you rather have to buy three instruments over the course of your life or have the chance at maybe buying two? And as somebody who plays tuba and euphonium, I can tell you like, okay, yeah, I'm probably going to own more than two instruments over the course of my life because the odds that I'll change because I find something that works better for me is, is there, but I'm probably recouping some of those costs because I'm going to sell my old instrument. But if I have to trash one because it's unplayable, that's just adding dozens of operating costs. And I could buy, I could probably clean my horn for upwards of four years for the amount that it would cost to buy a Cherveni Piggy, which is like a pretty solid three quarter C tuba. So uh, just clean your horns. <laughs> That's really all there is to it. And there's some. Uh, other like little piecemeal things that you can do uh sort of everyday cleanings in order to help aid in the desinkification or uh the prevention of desinkification on your instruments so the first is clean and neutralize your mouth before you play and so the best way to do that is brush your teeth before you play and this isn't necessarily an all the time thing i try to do it before every time i play but Sometimes that just isn't something that's available to you. But trying to do it as many times as possible is a really, really good practice to get into because you're going to clean and eliminate the bacteria from your oral cavity and your mouth, and it's going to give you a chance to eliminate any of the food residue that's in there. And so if we're il trying to eliminate uh, all of that bacteria and food residue at the source, less of it is going to accumulate inside of our instruments. Mitigating factors will save you money in the long term. And brushing your teeth isn't very expensive. I mean, and, and if you have a pretty acidic microbiome, a pretty acidic mouth, then maybe uh, you might want to find a more uh, neutralizing toothpaste. And what I would suggest for that is a baking soda-based toothpaste. Arm & Hammer is a really great baking soda-based toothpaste that's pretty inexpensive in the grand scheme of things. I think it's like... Two three dollars a tube and is available anywhere you can buy toothpaste. I, I'd see it at Walmart all the time, and I have a pretty acidic microbiome, and that's what I use, and I find it works really, really, really well. Uh, another thing you can do is clean your mouthpiece, and that's not something a lot of people think of, but when you play. Your primary mode of contact with your horn is through the mouthpiece. And so if we can eliminate some of the residue that's in there and chemically neutralize our mouthpiece, that will allow us to more effectively mitigate factors of chemical contact with our instrument. And so again, this is one of those things where you can do it really regularly and do it often because it's not very difficult. Virtually everybody owns a mouthpiece brush. If you don't, one is very inexpensive at your local music store. You could probably order one from somewhere if you don't have a local music store. And the best way to clean your mouthpiece is with vinegar and dish soap. So we use vinegar because it is a, a pretty acidic chemical cleaner. And that's one of, one of the things, uh, to jump back to the phosphoric acid thing really quick, is that sounds really intimidating. It's like, oh, you're going to put my horn in acid? Well, uh, yes, but the concentration of the acid is a really important factor to remember. So vinegar is a pretty non-concentrated acid and has a 1.4 pH most of the time, which is... And, and if we think about our pH scale really quick, pH goes from 1 to 14. So 1.4 is a pretty strong acid, but I wouldn't consider vinegar to be like that terrible. I mean, you can let vinegar sit on your arm and it doesn't burn. Uh, lemon juice, I think, is a 2 pH, so that's a pretty strong acid too. 
So, I mean, these, these things can be really safe and still really effective. And the phosphoric acid cleaner that we'll use when you get your horns chem cleaned is about as acidic as vinegar is. But we don't want to, and like you can use vinegar to chem clean your horn, but I don't find that it works quite as well as phosphoric acid does because the phosphorus acid that's in there is bonds so much more readily to uh, calcium and lime than uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar does. But because we're cleaning our mouthpieces at home, vinegar is more than adequate and it's such a small space so like you don't have to invest tons in a lot of vinegar and dish soap in order to do it the thing you'll have to make sure when you're cleaning your mouthpiece at home is to saturate your vinegar with enough enough dish soap so that it starts to look like dish soap that has a lot of water in it rather than uh more on the clear side so for example if you use blue dawn it has that nice like super aqua color um, it should look like a lightish version of that. And it, when you're cleaning a mouthpiece, you don't really need tons. You probably use like a pint to a quart of vinegar. And so like it doesn't take a boatload of dish soap either. And I mean, you can get a gallon of vinegar at Walmart for probably like $2 and a boatload of Dawn for um, about the same price. So and, and that solution is good for a load of cleanings. You can probably get like six... Uh, not six, probably like a good hundred mouthpiece cleanings out of one solution really, really effectively. It might get a little gross, but, and like if you're, but if you clean your mouthpiece every week, like that's a a lot over the long term, and it's really cost effective. One qualifier I'll say is if you use a stainless steel mouthpiece, um, I would recommend isopropyl alcohol. Steel just gets weird when you bring it in contact with stuff. And while it's called stainless steel, uh, stainless steel will still stain and corrode in the grand scheme of things. And so isopropyl alcohol is really, really effective and evaporates really fast. So if you use something like a Giddings or a Parker that's stainless steel, I would, um, if it's a component, I would separate all the components and then I would let it soak in the isopropyl alcohol for like a hot sec and then just pull it out because that will kill most of that bacteria pretty, pretty fast. And then just make sure you're swabbing it with the mouthpiece brush. And so after you've cleaned your mouthpiece and if you've been cleaning and neutralizing your mouth, the next best thing you can do is get your horn clean pretty regularly. So when I say regularly, what I mean is if if you play your horn about two hours a day or more, you probably need to get it cleaned twice a year. Ideally, that's an every six-month cleaning. But if you have like a a five-month, seven-month split just because of that works best with your schedule or even like even if you push it and do an eight and a four, that works pretty well too. Um, But... Uh, if you have multiple instruments, obviously, that can get pretty weird. So, for example, if I was a gigging trumpet player and I'm doing a lot of freelance orchestral gigs, meaning my C trumpet is the primary instrument I'm playing, but if I'm also in a quintet and my B-flat and my flugelhorn are getting a lot of use too, but not on average more than two hours a day, I can probably get away with only cleaning my B-flat and my flugel once every year. But that C, probably getting cleaned twice a year. And remember that your practicing is included in your playing time. So all of that needs to be taken into account. But those are those are ways of not necessarily having to spend an arm and a leg. Another thing you can do is learn how to chem clean at home. And if you uh, hire the right technician to consult on that, you can learn how to do that really, really effectively. Some might not be open to that, but others are. Because, I mean, things can be expensive. And if you have a relationship with your technician... And they are are willing to teach you how to do those kinds of things. The trust that you will have with them probably means that they're the person you're going to if you ever need serious work done on your instrument. Because accidents happen. I don't know almost anybody that has a blemishless instrument. It's going to happen. Another thing you can do to help prevent long-term and in a lot of cases, short-term, uh, like, um, desinkification is avoid using lanolin-based greases. And there's a lot of people who, like, swear by lanolin stuff. And lanolin is fine. 
uh, I'm, I will be the last to say that it's, it's a bad slide grease. But here's the problem. It's not 1950 anymore. And in 19, like the, the 20s to 50s, I mean, it was hard to find a better water repellent grease than lanolin that was so inexpensive. But we want to avoid introducing organic material into our instrument. And so, and part of that is because it breaks down really fast. But lanolin in particular is incredibly alkaline. And so when we talk about alkaline, it means that they tend to break down negatively as ions at regular room temperature and pressure. And so when we introduce negatively charged chemicals to our instrument, which are positively charged, uh, filled with poly positively charged ions in the metals, what's going to happen? That zinc is going to bond to what's more negatively charged rather than to what's positively charged because opposites attract chemically. And so... This begs the question of why would we do introduce negative chemicals to our instruments if in the grand scheme of things, it's going to separate them? And the answer is we shouldn't. And so now that, like I said, it's not 1950 anymore. Synthetic greases are cheaper and cleaner than lanolin. And so you can find really inexpensive synthetic slide grease at any music store that you can go to. Super Slick is a brand that's m widely distributed throughout the United States. It is incredibly inexpensive. I would be surprised if Super Slick slide grease was less than $2 or $2.50. Or excuse me, I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than $2 or $2.50. And is one of the best and cleanest slide greases on the market. When you're... Grease is clear, you're in the clear. You should only be using clear synthetic slide greases because they're so much cleaner and so much more efficient and so much cheaper than the other slide greases on the market. Again, it's not 1950 anymore. We don't have to use lanolin. Uh, and so for uh, to double back really quick, for anybody who doesn't know what lanolin is, lanolin is the waxy, yellowy substance that's excreted from the pores of sheep in order to make their water or their wool stay water repellent. Not something it sounds like I want to put on my instrument. And synthetic greases are cleaner and cheaper. So just get synthetic grease. And so all of these practices together can really, really extend the life of your instrument. I mean, like potentially 10 to 20 years longer on the life of your horn, if not longer than that. And it's, it just makes a world of a difference. And so... It's really important that you get your horns cleaned, but not just get your horns cleaned, get them chemically cleaned. Like I said earlier, cleaning in the bathtub is a glorified half measure compared to chemical cleaning. And we want to make sure that our horns are neutralized because it will eliminate all of that bacteria, all of those calcium and lime deposits, and fortify the brass alloy and help our horns last longer and save us money because... If our horns get rotted, those are the big dollar repairs. A lot of people talk about the big dollar repairs just being like, oh, TSA messed up my instrument, which is all too common. But replacing parts because of red rot, because you didn't bother to get your horn cleaned, is far, far more common. And I say that as somebody who has worked on thousands of instruments over the last several years. It's one of the most common things I see. So thanks so much for listening today. I hope you took something away from this. Uh, again, uh, cleaning your horns is one of the most important things that you can do, and I hope that all of y'all go either find a technician who can clean your horns or go see the technician that you already know and trust to get your horn clean this summer. Thanks so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Musical Trick Artista, the podcast. You can find us online at mcgowanmusic.com or listen on your favorite podcast platform. You can also visit us at Andrew McGowan on YouTube or Music McGowan on Instagram.